Content warning. This podcast discusses violence, murder, suicide, civil unrest, aggressive policing, racism, and lynching. If you or anyone you know is considering suicide or self-harm or just need to talk about problems, please call the National Suicide Prevention Lifeline at 1-800-273-8255 or text the Crisis Text Line at 741-741. Previously, on After the Uprising. On October 17th, she found Danye hanging from this tree in their backyard. I called 911 and all I remember screaming is my baby. It didn't look right, so, you know, he said, let's take pictures. That's why Melissa McKinnis wants St. Louis County Police to dig deeper. All signs ran off the bat pointed that this was a suicide. We know what the facts of the case are, so we, we never are ever going to go out there and say, well, you know, Donnie's mom is wrong. McKinnis, a prominent Ferguson activist, told me she thinks her family is being targeted. The lead detective in the case, he was laughing. It was more like we were wasting his time. Like he had somewhere to be. Almost as if my son wasn't dead. Did you get the impression he knew who you were? Yes. What you're looking at is the aftermath of the grand jury deciding not to indict Officer Wilson. A young man found hanging from a tree in October. His mom believes someone murdered her son, targeting him. Kanye became an activist in the wake of the shooting death of Michael Brown by a white police officer. That's why Melissa McKinnis wants St. Louis County Police to dig deeper into her son's death. He was not suicidal. This is After the Uprising, the death of Donye Dion Jones. It's a new era at the St. Louis County Prosecutor's Office. For the first time in almost 30 years, someone other than Bob McCullough is calling the shots. Five on your side's Rachel Menatop is live in Clayton, where Wesley Bell took the oath of office today. On January 1st, 2019, right around the time our burner phone was arriving with Melissa, Wesley Bell was sworn in as the first black prosecuting attorney for St. Louis County, unseating the longtime incumbent Bob McCullough, who famously refused to indict Officer Darren Wilson for killing Mike Brown Jr. Get after me. I... <laughs> I state your name, Wesley Bell. A criminal justice reform advocate, experienced defense attorney, and former Ferguson City Councilor who got into politics after the Michael Brown shooting and protests, Bell says he promises to give everyone a fair shake. Right before Bell was sworn in, the prosecuting attorneys and investigators in what would be his office voted to join the police union. It seemed like a massive conflict of interest. Bell having just been elected on a promise of criminal justice reform, would now have to operate with a staff that itself was in league with the police. If the residents of St. Louis County were hopeful that Bell's election signaled that a new dawn of police accountability was on the horizon, this wasn't a good sign. Everything that I do is to make sure this county stays safe, to make sure that everyone gets a fair shake, And as long as I I hold this office, that I promise you, that promise I will keep. One of the claims that was repeated in the media about Donye's death was that Melissa believed it could be related to her activism in Ferguson. So we have to go back here, back to the end of summer of 2014, when Mike Brown Jr. was killed on Canfield Avenue in Ferguson, Missouri. On that hot August afternoon, Residents quickly filled the streets in response to the killing and subsequent leaving of the 18-year-old's body in the street for hours. Pockets of neighbors who intended to stay out on the streets through the night, maybe through many nights, began talking. One group of young people, full of passion and a desire to see things change, came to calling themselves Lost Voices. 
we all, we all camp out. So this is your tent? Yeah, this is my tent. This is where I sleep. Here is Leonard Smith showing a news crew the Lost Voices tent encampment. And so the first night you actually didn't have a tent, right? No, I did not. What did you sleep on the first night? The first night that I spent the night, I actually slept in a chair and just kind of nodded away. It was night after night after night. Not near one of us knowing who each other was. This is Dante Carter. You heard him in episode one, talking about the noose that somebody left in their camp. Night after night, we was coming out here protesting. Plain and simple. We don't, we never been to a protest before, but it's like everything worked in, in like some magical way. Like all the draw us all this into this one spot. Though most of the members of Lost Voices were in their late teens and early 20s, a few grown adults joined with them. One of them was Melissa. I know why I became a Lost Voices because we were more out there. I can see they were troubled, to be honest. I I wouldn't want my children hanging around with them, but I love their fight. I saw that the amount of work that they put in of not going in the house, being out there night and day, having a set march, a set shutdown of the streets, sleeping in tents, stuff like that. We were more radical. One of the members of Lost Voices, Joshua Williams, remembers the police being immediately hostile towards activists. Every night he was out there, they was out there pointing guns and stuff. And he had some of the bad officers that was out there, you know, calling people the N-word. Joshua's mother told him that if he joined in the protests for Mike Brown, not to bother coming home. My, my mom didn't really approve of me going out there. So he said... If I go out there, then I'm about to come home. So, there's a statement for people out there. So, he found people in the movement to stay with, including Melissa, who became a surrogate mother to Joshua. We thought that he was a runaway, but we just couldn't find out where he was supposed to be because he told us so many different stories. We'd all have to pitch in and get him shoes and clothes and coats and stuff like that. But he was, he was really into it. You can tell that his heart was in, in the fight. My family will tell you. I, I've always had my door open for kids to come and stay with me. Because they were all in Lost Voices together, Joshua also knew Donye. So we asked Joshua to tell us about him. Uh, I met him through Melissa, which I call her my mom. He was, he was cool. Uh, he... They helped me to get through some, some, some nights, you know. He's an outgoing person, very smart and intelligent. When you first met him, was he out in the streets with everybody too? Yeah. Yeah, he was out there with us. He always stayed by his mom, though. One night, it was like a very hectic night, and two guests all over the place. And this old lady was stuck in a, in a wheelchair. And uh, he came out of nowhere and pushed her out the, after, uh, we asked Joshua what his initial reaction was to hearing that Danya had passed away. I was shocked because he, he got light going for himself, you know. So I think if somebody else, he, well, my initial thought was he didn't do it, you know. That's my initial thought, and it still is. Lost Voices was the heart and soul of, of, of the resistance. You can't talk about Ferguson without talking about the Lost Voices, and that's just a real, that's just real, real talk. This is Tef Poe, Melissa's activist, rapper cousin, who we spoke with in episode one. The thing with Melissa is she's not a St. Louis transplant. She didn't move here from another city and all of a sudden become a political activist. When you're, when you're there every day, day in and day out, you're sitting in it when it's not a hot topic. You're sitting in it when somebody goes to jail and it's not an explosive issue on the internet. When you get pulled over and the cop remembers you from yelling at him five years ago and somebody you were with might have spit on the cop. You don't dodge that. You don't have a, 
You're not at the conferences drinking lattes with the people you were just Twitter beefing with last week. You know, like, you're not on the cover of Essence for doing Jack Biddley shit. You're actually in the community dealing with real issues, real problems. What I remember about the Lost Voices early on is the nonprofit side of the, uh, of the movement knew that they couldn't really control them. You know, like, you could will somebody else in and be like, hey, these are the talking points in case you want to do media. You could do this, you could do that. Lost Voices was so authentic that you really couldn't get them to tap into none of that shit. It was just real talk, real energy, and people who had nothing to lose. Without Lost Voices, there would be no Ferguson movement. Weeks after the major protests had died down, members of Lost Voices were still marching and still camping out in the streets. The Lost Voices have changed location several times. Right now, they're at the back of this vacant parking lot. And what's significant about their location is they're just a few blocks from where Mike Brown was killed. And this is the road where thousands of protesters were marching just a few weeks ago. Most members of Lost Voices were men, but there were a few women, including founding member Cheyenne Green. Here she is, speaking at a rally in October of 2014. Hi, my name's Cheyenne. I'm with um, the Lost Voices. We've been on Ground Zero in Ferguson for 64 days, sleeping in the streets, keeping our presence. And I want to get this started by chanting Black Lives Matter. Black Lives Matter! Black Lives Matter! Black Lives Matter! We spoke with Cheyenne about those days and nights working with the Lost Voices. Whenever we uh, stayed out on our first night, we just talked all night. We didn't have anything to sleep on or anything like that. And we just talked all night about all of our ideals, what we wanted to do. We didn't know what activism was or anything. And as the days went along, um, people started to bring tents, food every day, um, just Everything you can think of, want and need. We um, occupied on three different locations on West Forsen, but after the third time of our um, campsite being invaded by the police, everybody just uh, had went back to their homes. Lost Voices activists were trying to maintain a permanent presence on West Florissant until the announcement about whether or not Darren Wilson would be indicted. Ferguson police were not going to make it easy. Here's Melissa. They took the the tents, threw them in the street, and they said, you better be careful. Be, no, choose your battles wisely. You, you're playing a dangerous game, a deadly game. Loaded up in trucks, all of our property. Is that legal? Is that legal for them to touch our things and put it up? How can they just grab our stuff and put it on trucks and say, I'm taking it? The fuck is that? Ain't nobody stupid. They trying to scare a motherfucker. We'll be on this street standing, but I bet we still be out here. This is audio from a cell phone video shot by Cheyenne. In the video, the activists have about eight to ten tents in a parking lot, and they are surrounded by city workers who are preparing to cart away all of their belongings. Police are protecting the city workers, telling them to load them up, load them up. Only a few Lost Voices members are present, and there's also a small girl there, maybe five or six years old. She's carrying a doll. Y'all got to give us a second. Y'all can't expect us to grab nothing that quick. Hey, uh-uh, uh-uh. Let her go. Let her go. Let her go. There is a young woman in a red sweatshirt. Two police officers are grabbing at her arms. Let her go. Uh-uh, y'all better let Abby go. A second young woman, Abby approached the arresting officers very calmly, seemingly trying to talk them out of arresting her friend when she too is grabbed and arrested. Why are you grabbing her by her neck? You're not in her room, ma'am. You're not in her I'm not. I'm recording. I have the, all the rights to record it. A large male officer has the small woman in a reverse headlock. He holds her this way while another large male officer puts her in handcuffs. She isn't offering any resistance. Look at him, grabbing her by her neck in a choco. Grabbing her by her neck. It's okay, ladies, you don't look at this. Yeah, can I take her bag? Why would y'all lock her up? She ain't doing nothing. Why would Oh my gosh! Cheyenne is asking why the second young woman, Abby, was being arrested for having done nothing when her attention shifts to the two officers who are carrying away the woman in the red sweatshirt. 
by lifting her off of the ground by her handcuffed hands and her feet. She looks hogtied. What? Okay, why the fuck are you grabbing her like an animal? Like, seriously, that's fucking crazy. That is fucking crazy. You're not unloading a tent. You need to leave. Leave now or you will be placed under arrest. Their small tent occupations were violently dismantled. Their belongings thrown into city trailers while police arrested two young women for daring to question them. Lost Voices members returned to their homes but stayed in contact and stayed active. The local police, however, did not let up. Well, for the Darren Wilson non-indictment thing, um, we were getting ready for it. So we had a safety meeting. It was at the church. There was this guy named Chris Schaefer. He was supposed to be a live streamer. We told everyone there would be no live streaming, no recording of any kind, no devices, you know, um, for safety reasons, you know. So I turn around and I see the guy, Chris Schaefer. He got his little thing up. Did you know this guy before that? Never. Never Nobody's ever seen this guy before. So um, I turn around and I say, listen, did you know what we just said? He said, no, I didn't hear you. I said, no live streaming, no recording, no recording devices at all. He said, oh, well, all right. And so he put it down. So then he took he took it back out. But I couldn't see what he was doing with his phone. So I told his friend, this your friend, tell him that he can't be doing this. So she told him. So this time I moved. I moved like five pews up. So then... Like, all of a sudden, I turn around, and he's recording again, sitting right behind me. So I'm like, dude. You know, And but the meeting started already. So I stood up, and I said, the phone is off the hook. That's like code for stop the meeting. Someone's listening. So this other man just ran and grabbed Chris Schaefer and picked him up and threw him in the middle of the aisle. And I was like, damn. I'm like, oh, wait, 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 wait. By that time, like, the guy ran over and they started dragging Chris out of the church. So then finally, probably like five, ten minutes later, I went out. They was like, yeah, we got his phone. I'm taking it to the pawn shop and all that. And I see Chris running up the street. I said, are y'all serious? I said, so y'all think that we are here to do this? He said, man, look, I'm going to take his phone, take it to the pawn shop. I said, no, you're not. And so with my organization, they knew not to mess with us, you know. So it was what we said. I said, nah. And the guy gave me the phone. We got in the car and we drove the street to find Chris. Well, we were looking and we saw to the right there's a Walgreens. And we saw Heather's van. So we pulled up and I said, this is um, your friend's phone. She said, oh, okay. They're taking him to the hospital. I said, can you make sure you get his phone? All of a sudden, I see a video with his phone, the huge, that I gave him back, telling his story. Hi, this is Student. I didn't go to the um, feather protest tonight in Ferguson, but I went to a meeting, and I, I did get beat up. I was not live streaming at this meeting at all. I got hurt tonight. Somebody thought I was, you know, maybe they thought I was a cop, or they thought that... I was live streaming something that shouldn't have been live stream. I'm in the hospital right now. I'm in the emergency room. I had to get an x-ray. I had to get um, a head scan. Well, probably like a few days later to a week later, I found out they had a warrant out for my arrest and like some other people. Now, the other people actually, they did whoop his ass. But they just threw me in there for extra. You know what I'm saying? Like, yeah, we can get that whole organization and shut them down. Were the people who actually did toss them out, uh, are they part of your organization? or were they just A people? few of them. But mm-hmm. the one who actually tossed them out, we don't know. who. He, we didn't know who this guy was that actually initially mm-hmm. did it, you know. And since they didn't, uh, some of them didn't have money to fight, they were either facing jail time or probation. So they picked probation there. So with when I got caught, 
Um, Did you know you had a warrant out of that? You, you knew it was out. Yeah, right? they you told me. It was like, everybody was like, Melissa, just wait. You don't need to be out there like that. And I was like, nah. I said, if they catch me, they catch me. Mm -hmm. I know how to do it. To pull this all back in, Melissa was at an activist meeting in 2014 when a young white man, Chris Schaefer, who was not known to most people in attendance, was seemingly live streaming or using his phone when everyone had been asked to keep their devices put away. Melissa alerted the room, and a larger man who no one in her organization knew ran over and ripped Chris from his seat and yanked him outside. Others followed, and Chris was beaten up. When Melissa went outside to see what was happening, someone had stolen Chris's phone with the intention of selling it. Melissa told this person, absolutely not, and she was able to collect Chris's phone and find his friend Heather up the block, to whom she returned the phone. Chris had his phone back that night and used it to live stream himself from his hospital bed. Melissa was charged with robbery for her efforts and was arrested later at the St. Louis Donald Trump rally in 2016 for her outstanding warrant in this case. They ended up putting me under suicide watch. Yeah. They wouldn't give me my medication knowing that I have an illness. They talked to my doctors. They said they was going to give me my medication and they didn't. Yeah. And what were the actual charges? Like it was, was felony, on, was a mis felony. misdemeanor? Felony. Strong on robbery and uh, strong on robbery and assault. Several of her activist friends were also charged, and she believes this was a way to stifle the movement. With people taking plea deals of probation, they would be much more hesitant to engage in street demonstrations. How did it resolve? Did You were just acquitted? Mm -hmm. Okay. Because it went on for so long, and they had no proof, you know, but they did have proof that I was the one that gave him his phone. We wanted to know how the St. Louis County Police came up with the five names, including Melissa's, of people whom they determined to charge with assaulting and robbing Chris Schaefer. Did he give them those names? Unfortunately, we haven't been able to speak with Chris himself for comment, but we did connect with one of his ex-girlfriends. He was dating a young woman at the time of the incident at the church. She didn't want to be named or to have her voice in our podcast, so we have to just give a brief summary of what she told us. Chris was a student who had a new interest in journalism. He wasn't so much an activist, but he wanted to try his hand at reporting live from the large protests that had been rising in St. Louis. The night he got beaten up, she says he wasn't live streaming because she was checking his feed, but he was texting with her, which may have been what caused the confusion. Interestingly, she told us that when Chris got out of the hospital, the police asked him to come in and to look at photographs from which to identify his attackers. His ex-girlfriend says that she went down to the police station with him, but that he refused to identify anybody. As they passed pictures before him, she says Chris would just say, I don't remember, I don't remember, I don't remember. She says Chris felt the incident wasn't worth ruining anyone's life over. And we can't help but wonder what photographs the police were showing to Chris, where they'd come from and why they'd been selected. If what his ex-girlfriend says is true, Chris never pointed anyone out and didn't seem interested in cooperating with a case. Why then did St. Louis County pursue charges against five people, including Melissa, who spent time in jail, mysteriously on suicide watch no less? Melissa spent time and money preparing to fight the charges in court and had to avoid violating the terms of her bail by further protesting. I went to court on my trial date it was actually Diane was with me um, and my attorney came out in the hallway and said you free to go it was like all charges dropped and uh, you know on the video you can see my reaction and then that's when I hugged Diane and Diane was like you know mom that's now you can really go hard with you know everything and I was like yeah This apparent attempt by St. Louis County police to squash Melissa's activities by ensnaring her in a court case, threatening her with felony charges and over a decade in jail, would of course diminish what little faith she may still have had in local law enforcement. But at the very end of that fateful year, 2014, something would happen to destroy that faith entirely. I parked my car 
some ways from where Antonio Martin was killed. So I walked and I made my way through the crowd. And then there was a line um, of police. Late in the night on December 23rd, a young black man named Antonio Martin was shot and killed at a mobile gas station in the St. Louis suburb of Berkeley. It didn't take long for word to spread among the activist community, and Melissa quickly joined the growing crowd at the mobile gas station, with Danye by her side. If anybody ever came close to, like, pushing me, Danye would make sure to pull me out the way. So Danye acted sort of like your personal bodyguard yeah. when you were out there. Yeah. He didn't talk too much. He wanted to show that he was kind of make people think that he was, like, tough, you know. Something went off. Uh, it caused an explosion. And then I remember them jumping on Cap, Paul, and Bruce. Cap Kennedy, Paul Mohammed, and Bruce Franks Jr. were all members of a group called the Peacekeepers that formed after the police raided the Lost Voices tent encampments. The Peacekeepers were trained in de-escalation tactics and would go to protests to stand as a buffer between the police and members of the community. They wore shirts that in large white letters spelled out Peacekeeper. This is how Cap Kennedy remembers that night. Yeah, but on that particular day, we were attacked by the police. The cop came and attacked me first. I was standing in place. Like, I didn't even do anything for the cop to agitate me. He just walked up, and before you know he had his hands around my neck. Somebody had threw something, like a little like a firecracker or a flashbang or something. Get on the ground! Get on the ground! As Cap was being grabbed by an officer, a second peacekeeper, Bruce Franks, reached out to hold on to Cap, and they fell over. Somehow I was tied up with Bruce, and I could feel the community people trying to pull me away, and uh, the police just started spraying mace everywhere. It was stomping and hitting and spraying everybody. Once on the ground, police officers piled on Bruce and began kicking him, striking him with batons, macing him, and bending his fingers. All the while, Bruce screamed, I'm not fighting. I'm not fighting. Joshua Williams is close friends with Bruce Franks, and he was there that night at the mobile station, watching as police violently assaulted Bruce. He's like a brother to me. So I was, you know, super angry. Everything got crazy. Everybody stopped running over there by the crit trip. So I was just running along with them. And um, at that time, they broke the glass, and I ran in there and set the newspapers on fire. They, they put it out with, like, some type of milk or something. Angry at watching his friend Bruce get piled on and beaten by police, Joshua had gone across the street to a quick trip gas station and started a small fire that was quickly doused and never actually caught. Meanwhile, back at the mobile gas station. This audio comes from a police body camera from that night. It was made public years later, in 2018, when Bruce sued the St. Louis County Police Department, as well as a handful of specific officers, for assaulting him at that protest. Contained within the video is not just the assault, but some friendly banter between police officers after the fact. The audio can be hard to make out, so you have to listen closely. First, we hear the officer whose body cam this audio came from telling another cop that he went through a whole can of mace. And just as he says this, a woman in the crowd is complaining to another officer about him, pointing him out, saying, him right there, holding the mace. She is yelling that she caught him on film macing people who were already subdued. And the body cam wearing officer then moves far behind the police line and tells another cop that a white bitch caught me spraying everyone. So he's going to hide back here for a little bit. The body cam wearing officer actually goes on to complain that the gas station is a bad place to be fighting people because it's too well lit. 
it's just a terrible place to fight you for the most part. Second life and everything else. Then, the footage cuts to the body cam wearing officer speaking with another cop, who asks him, did you get any stick time? Did you get any uh, stick time in a way? No, but I went to a whole bottle of mace. Yeah, I went to a whole can of mace. Yeah, I had a couple of little bits, yeah. The officer wearing the body camera is Timothy Anderer. At the time of this incident in late December of 2014, he seems to have been a regular patrol officer. He would be promoted to detective, though, within a month. So either the department higher-ups had already decided to promote Anderer to detective by December 2014, when he's on film bragging about using excessive force against protesters, and this misconduct didn't change their minds, or it was a decision that they made after the night in question. Either way, his promotion would seem to signal the St. Louis County Police Department's attitude towards the public at large, but especially the black population that had the temerity to take to the streets to call for police accountability. The release of Officer Anderer's body camera footage from the Christmas Eve protest didn't happen until November of 2018. So when Detective Anderer showed up at Melissa's house with a fresh black eye on the morning of Danye's death, she had no idea who he was or what he'd been caught doing and bragging about. Yeah, not to know that that officer would be sitting in my living room on October 17th. Because if I would have known that that was him, he wouldn't be sitting in my living room. I would have told them I need somebody else here. Timothy Anderer was promoted to detective after brutalizing Bruce Franks, actions which Bruce sued both Anderer and the St. Louis County Police over. On the flip side, Joshua Williams is still in prison for his actions that night at the gas station. A news team had filmed the scene and turned over their footage to police who were able to identify Joshua. Despite having no previous police record, and despite the fire having quickly been doused before causing any damage, Joshua is currently serving an eight-year prison sentence for the arson, along with charges of burglary and stealing. How much time did the prosecutor first ask for? Do you know? He asked for 15 at first. After Josh had came from the quick trip, he had jumped in my back seat. He smelled like gasoline or something, you know. And the rest of them, they, they were trying to get in my car and they was like, Melissa, pop the trunk. And I was like, pop the trunk for what? And he's like, we have some liquor. I said, where you get that from? And these were the youngs. Where you get that from? And Josh said, I got some too. I said, get the hell out of my car. I said, you know better. I said, get that shit out of my car. And I was yelling at them. And they had to go find another ride. But I kind of wish that I had got a hold to Josh that night and um, talk to him. So I kind of felt bad that I didn't hold on a little bit tighter with him. After that good year or two, there was no more law school doing things together. This is Cheyenne again. She explained that after all of the arrests and harassment from the police, members of Lost Voices went their separate ways. Though many did stay active, both Cheyenne and Melissa were among those who organized the large and impactful Jason Stockley protests in 2017. Cheyenne also got involved in conventional politics. Through my activism, I've gotten more into politics, working directly with um, Wesley Bell, who was beat the incumbent Bob McCullough after 28 years serving as St. Louis County Prosecutor. And now we have, for the first time, a black St. Louis County Prosecutor. Wesley Bell's path to county prosecutor began in the first major election after the uprising, when Bell was elected to the Ferguson City Council. The next election also saw the beaten and maced peacekeeper Bruce Franks Jr. win election to the Missouri General Assembly. These political achievements, which received a great deal of media attention, took place against a less noticed reality. The disintegration of Lost Voices and other Ferguson frontline groups, and many activists, carrying not only legal charges and fines, but significant trauma as well. You know, I used to try to help a lot of those guys, you know, because they were basically street dudes that beforehand weren't doing anything 
notable or worthy of news, you know, and when this happened, they became heroes overnight because of being brazen. This is Jamie Dennis. He is the director of the Save Our Sons program at the Urban League in St. Louis. His office is in a career center that was constructed on the site of the quick trip that was burned down in Ferguson during the uprising. We asked Jamie for 10 minutes of his time, and he gave us two hours. As he showed us around the career center, people kept coming up to him, thanking him, hugging him, or just saying what's up. Every person from Lost Voices or the wider Ferguson movement that we would ask him about, he knew. Also, he is Melissa's cousin through marriage. We asked him about Melissa, about Donye, about the police, about the uprising, about everything. This was the place that launched this national movement, mm -hmm. right? But then a very few set of people became prominent national recognizable voices. And meanwhile, folks like, let's say, Lost Voices mm -hmm. that were down mm -hmm. camping mm -hmm. in the street, mm -hmm. right? making this mm -hmm. happen, mm -hmm. feel maybe a little left behind. They feel slighted. Yeah. yeah. And it's a whole different group of the Ferguson Frontline protesters that feel slighted. Yeah. And they don't even feel like Lost Boys was a significant part as they were. So you find all these different groups going to tell you these different stories. From what you're hearing, from what you've seen, uh, have uh, the police in this county mm -hmm. internalized the lessons that they should have internalized? Have they reformed? Have you know, are things moving yeah. in a better direction? They are in small, small moments, but no. You got Kim Gardner, you got Wesley Bell, who are more pro-citizen, and you have the cops feeling like apprehensive because they feel like we don't appreciate law enforcement here. Therefore, it has an adverse effect of certain cops not being as diligent when it comes to straight up and down police work. So that's the backlash, you know, after what happened. Okay, we can't flag you. We can't um, arrest you and beat you up or can't hold you up in court and, you know, take your license and stuff like that. So hell, we'll let somebody shoot you. We'll wait till the body is actually on the ground before we show up or, you know, we we'll let your house burn. So that's interesting that you say that because mm -hmm. one of the things we're looking at with uh, mm -hmm. the death of Donye is right. that the morning when St. Louis mm -hmm. County police showed up, according to Melissa and uh, her whole family, mm -hmm. honestly, they didn't get the feeling that, the, that any of the cops were taking it terribly seriously. Mm -hmm. And there was sort of a, yeah, just a general tone of disrespect at several levels and do you think that has a, a relation to this this whole attitude of like, well, you didn't like the police, well, now you need us, well, too too bad. It's backlash, absolutely, I agree a thousand percent that that's what's going on. But at the same respect, with my cousin Melissa, you got to understand that this is such a touchy case that this put a riff in our own family to where certain family members don't talk to Melissa. Uh, certain family members feel like it's more to it that she's not saying so you know i love melissa got big love for melissa i've always been supportive but she went into a dark sense and rightfully so losing her child yeah. and it became to a point where people were abandoning her i think the ferguson movement that she was a part of didn't support her you know the way they could have i see melissa a lot during the jason stockley verdict because she was in rare form that was before dj but after that happened, you know, and then she... What do you mean she was in rare form? Can you tell me more about her? In rare form, time? man, volcanic, dynamic, you know, fearless lioness out there on the front line. Better than some of these guys out here, man. These girls just give me chills. I'm telling you, the Ferguson frontline protesters was really the girls. It was really the girls. I ain't worried about lost voices and all that stuff. They were doing that to show off for the girls. You said your family had division in it mm -hmm. over this issue. Mm -hmm. Do you think that's going to remain, or do you think you're, with time, that'll sort of settle down and you guys will be able to kind of come back together? And, like, I can't see it. I can't see Melissa getting over it, you know, because it's so heavy. It's like, it's her son, you know. I've seen family members hold grudges for lesser things than this. So death, that usually puts permanent wages in families, man, especially when it's like this where people are like, oh, I think he might have committed suicide or I think that is this and she's just looking for attention because of this. So many unsensitive things have been said to this girl. Perhaps it's easy from the outside to think that it's paranoid not to trust the police. At least for people who have had the privilege of 
not having to deal with the police on a regular basis. Whatever your stance on the police is, though, it's undeniable. That standing up to them as an institution, telling them that they aren't doing their jobs right or that they need to face heavier consequences, or that maybe they shouldn't exist at all, isn't going to make you any friends on the force. If you had been hassled and harassed every time you tried to engage in a constitutionally protected activity, if you watched your friends get arrested for nothing while just standing on the street, if your fellow activists were pulled over by streams of cops who threatened them and pointed guns at them, if someone you cared for, like a son, was given an eight-year sentence for a crime that hurt no one, and you yourself were charged with a felony and faced 15 years in prison for briefly holding a white man's cell phone as you attempted to return it to him, when even that man refused to name you as a suspect, how much faith would you have in the police? And then all of this, all of it, has to be stacked on top of a life lived in Ferguson in North St. Louis County. How much faith would you have if after all that, the detective who showed up to your house to help you figure out what happened to your dead son was being sued for beating and macing someone that you knew right in front of you? If all of this could completely diminish a person's faith in the police, what would it take to lose faith in another government entity, the one tasked with determining a person's cause of death? That's next time on After the Uprising. After the Uprising is directed, produced, investigated, written, and reported by myself, Rayno Vyshelsky, and John Duffy. John Duffy was also the editor. Dave Cassidy was producer. Sound engineering, design, and mix by Josh Condon. Executive producers were Matt McDonough and Tina Xeros for Now This. Brett Kushner for Group 9 Media. And Jess Borave was executive in charge of production. Jonathan Hartwig and Bradley Rayford were consulting producers. Eliza Craig was assistant producer and did additional reporting. Mallory Kenoy was a writer's assistant. Kristen McVicker and Taya Wilson were production assistants. And Haley Klesmer was a post-production assistant. Fact-checking by Allison Humes. Theme song and other music by Zachary Walter. Legal by Keith Sklar and Peter Yazzi. Special thanks to Ann Frado, Danny Gonzalez, Barbara Koppel, Alex Lester, Beth Ann Macaluso, Emily Marinoff, Ruth Baca, and the Reporters Committee for Freedom of the Press. After the Uprising is a production of Double Asterisk, iHeartMedia, and Now This in association with True Stories. You can find us on Twitter and Facebook. If you have useful information about the death of Donye Jones or anything we've covered, please leave a message on our tip line at 347-674-7401.